Coming up next, we've got a great show for you. We're going behind the scenes with the Public Safety Communications Office. You're going to learn the importance of communication in response to emergencies, the requirements and technical skills that it takes to keep that system together, and we'll be talking to the lead person of that organization, Karen Wong, so stick with us. Thank you for joining us. I'm Tina Walker and I'm here with Lori Newquist and we're with the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Today we're sitting in the heart of the State Operations Center, which is actually the hub of communications for the deployment of resources and personnel for response to any incident throughout California, be it wildfire, flood, you get the picture. Today we're joined with Karen Wong with the Public Safety Communications Office that recently joined the Governor's Office of Emergency Services and we're so happy you're here with us today. Thank you. This so is exciting. It is. It's fun. And we'd like to have this time to talk to you a little bit about PSCO and how mm -hmm. it's actually integrated into Cal OES and how it helps in emergency response throughout mm -hmm. the state. Um, so tell us a little bit about the organization. Okay. The organization, we have roughly 400 people that support and work for PSCO. Um, and as we have merged into Cal OES, some of those folks now sit at OES headquarters um, in procurement and HR and some of the other areas. But the majority of our staff are actually over off of Richards Boulevard and out in dispersed statewide in geographical areas, strategically state um, placed for re response if there's any radio issues as far as outages or just working with our client agencies to keep their radio systems up and running. We have three major programs. Um, our first program is <clears throat> excuse me, um, 911, and we're responsible for the funding of the infrastructure and its local reimbursement um, and policies for the infrastructure for um, 911 and also getting the state to move forward with the next generation of 911, which is basically um, having our uh, 911 system on an IP backbone. Having the system on the IP backbone, one of the areas for re emergency response that is going to be extremely helpful is that with that PSAPs being tied together, and the PSAP is a public safety answering point. So I, I kind of use that, that's a term we use all the time, but it's actually the um, public safety answering point. And with having them tied together, we've lost some of the PSAPs, um, the earthquake up north in Fortuna, we lost the PSAP for a couple of days because we had the outage. With having PSAPs all tied together on an IP backbone, will have intelligent routing. So if a PSAP goes down, it will intelligently route to the next closest PSAP so the 911 calls can always be answered. And that's extremely important to the citizens. That's probably the biggest benefit of the next generation of 911. However, we'll also be able to accept text messaging. Anybody with a child or knows of a child somewhere between nine and probably early 30s, um, everybody texts. And so there's an expectation by the citizens of California, actually at the national level, that we should be able to text 911. That will also be a benefit. The other benefit will be to be able to send still pictures and also video. So if there is something going on that you know the call taker or actually the first responder needs to see prior to responding, we'll be able to get the pictures over to them or the video. So it, it's really pretty exciting. So let's talk about 911. A lot okay. of people wouldn't have known, uh, well, and I certainly didn't until PSCO came over to Cal OES, mm -hmm. that you take care of that 911 infrastructure. What services or agencies in California do you serve or take care of? There are 458 public safety entry points in California. And who they belong to are the sheriffs, the police chiefs, and fire and EMS. So they're distributed statewide and it doesn't necessarily go with county it actually goes by population oh, so okay. we will have several PSAPs in a highly populated populated area and then our more rural counties will have just one or two so what's next for the future coming up I mean we're already we're doing text we're doing videos we're doing photos already with this communication what's next what's coming up next okay. in the future well we're not quite there with the video photo and text um, what we have right now is we have our legacy 911 system and that's our basically telephone system that we all trust and rely upon. Moving over to an IP backbone has been a challenge only because we cannot have 911 fail. 
so what we have done in california is we first developed our strategic plan for nine one one to get all of our stakeholders together we have a nine one one advisory board who have the appointees by the governor's office who represent the sheriff's office the police chiefs association fire chiefs as well as a couple of our largest stakeholder associations apco and cal nina so we have our board we worked closely with our board they reached out to their own stakeholders we put our strategic plan together and the strategic plan really pointed us to go to, go to the next generation of 911. Then we developed a roadmap on some of our questions and what we thought we needed to do to get there. And a lot of it was public outreach. So as that came up, in early 2011, we held six public meetings. And we actually solicited um, the local sheriffs, the local police chiefs, the local fire, as well as the public to get us feedback on what the expectations of what's of 911. Mm -hmm. We learned a lot about 911, and one of the most significant things, and everybody that knows me has to hear this, is there are actually heart pumps now that are um, being, you know, put in people that need the heart pumps um, to stay alive that can call 911. Amazing. But there's nobody on the other end to take that call because we don't have that type of an infrastructure set up yet. So okay. that's why next gen is so important. We have five pilot projects. Um, we have one at the northeastern part of California, and we've actually tied 32 PSAPs in 13 counties together. We were also able to test, first in the nation, to test the ability to do a lat-long location-based routing of the caller over an IP network, and that had not been done. It was still um, kind of sketchy at times with our wireless 911 calls, mm -hmm. but we were able to pinpoint that and save minutes for the, the folks calling 911 to get response out there. So you kind of touched on um, saving minutes for those that are calling in. Mm -hmm. and, and I noticed on my cell phone bill, there was kind of a surcharge yes. fee. Tell us a little bit about that. What does that mean? What does that entail? What are we paying for? Okay, you are paying for this network for the state. Um, right now, I think it's based at one half of 1% one per, uh, one of your interstate calls. So all the calls that you make, it, within California, get this one half of 1% based for this account. And it's called the State Emergency Telephone Number Account. And it's really to fund the 911 statewide. And again, we're one of the few states in the nation that have this ability to fund the statewide um, system. So all the equipment that's in the public safety answering points, all of their accessories that they need, whether it's a headset, um, the multitude of monitors some of them have actually six monitors on the front of their system mm -hmm. in order to be able to take the calls and be able to identify the locations um, and you touched on public outreach uh -huh. too. Um, and, and part of that education program tell us a little bit about 911 kids okay 911 for kids is an incredible organization and they're just they, they serve the schools and what they do is they go out and we um, help them we fund some of their educational resources as we do for other public safety answering points but their educational resources for kids and what they do is they keep track of the real heroes the the children that have called 911 for their parents and we have several um, award ceremonies for them throughout the year there is also one the largest award ceremony that we hold at the state capitol mm -hmm every year so that's always fun to participate we have a picture here um oh. is there a story you can share with us related to this little girl that's being recognized the little girl being recognized actually saved her mom by calling 911 she was in a very tough situation and i don't remember the details um specifically but she was in a very stressful situation and through going leaving her house going over to another um, neighbor's house, being able to articulate what happened, get on the phone, tell the, the police to come. She was actually able to save her, her mother. And then also, you'll see the dispatcher um, holding hers as well. Mm -hmm. She also, they have to talk a lot of the children through how to communicate and, and actually get the resources that they need where they need to be. So they really work together. It's phenomenal what some of these children can do in a very stressful environment. And so um, how did they learn to do this stuff? I mean, do you guys give them some tools, get them some information that helps them move forward in learning mm -hmm. this process and being able to do that properly The 911 for Kids is an outreach for um, elementary schools. 
and so what we do is we through the set in a fund the state emergency telephone number account fund the tools that they need to get these out there so they'll be coloring books they'll be other educational guides that they use to teach the children about nine one one that's awesome so we've talked about nine one one and then there's another component to communication that is more service-based, I would think. Um, tell us a little bit about the radio communications aspect. Okay, the radio communications, we have, um, we design, engineer, install, and maintain the radio communications for all the state's public safety agencies. Um, CHP, CAL FIRE, Fish and Game, Parks and Rec, OES. Mm -hmm. um, as well as some of the other small ones. We also do DOJ. We, we um, just got through installing some radio equipment for Department of Insurance because they do have investigators as well. So we support the radio systems. Um, radio systems tend to last forever. So we have to support not only 1980 technology, but current technology as well. So our staff are very diverse in radio communications. Um, it, they're pretty amazing. Companies will go out of business, so they have to actually fabricate the parts that we need to keep our legacy radio systems going. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of that in-house. We um, have our special projects unit. Before any radio system is deployed or even any new handheld system is that's used by any of our client agencies, they have to go through a rigorous testing. Mm -hmm. So we make sure that they can withstand the heat in the desert, um, the cold up in our higher low elevations, the salt water that they are being um, exposed to mm -hmm. daily. So they go through a pretty rigorous... Um, uh, See, these yeah. are things that we wouldn't even know. You know, as far mm -hmm. as radio use, it's like what we don't even consider that weather can impact it. And so that's a critical mm -hmm. component is training and then continuing that, mm -hmm. that um, system. Um, what about installation? We have a picture here that shows a pretty impressive tower with guys working on the tower. Tell us a little bit about that and um, also we have a mm -hmm. picture of a microwave installation and really for the general public and also for me. Um, what is, tell us about the installation and what exactly is microwave? Okay, microwave actually is one of those old technologies that I keep saying is becoming new again. Um, it is just a radio frequency that you have these very large dishes as you can see on the picture um, that actually captures the radio frequency. It, it can span quite a ways. Our towers can be 50 miles apart, line mm -hmm. of sight. Okay. Um, probably not quite as temperamental as a, a radio system with an antenna. Mm -hmm. And it's our backbone. that We have our microwave network that actually spans the state of California. Mm -hmm. So it is our backbone for our radio system. The, what's going on with our microwave system right now, it has been in place since mm -hmm. roughly 1947. Wow. We actually have the book that um, was written and they did it in books back then, um, to the Department of Finance to actually make this program mm -hmm. an organization. And it was actually under the Department of Finance at the time before they moved it to general services. But they have the same microwave maps that we use today because okay. it's the same footprint. So we have an analog system, and roughly 50% of our microwave is analog. And we're now we just we did a strategic plan, again, with all of our client agencies, very collaborative on how we're going to move forward to make this microwave a digital mm -hmm. system okay. for them. And the digital system will provide data if they need to send data over this network, okay. which we've never done before. So we're working on that, and it, it's, it's critical to many of the, the organizations that we serve. And also for the few of us that have been around for a very long time, it is the green phone system. And right. um, it has always worked all throughout the earthquakes we've had in California, the green phones have mm -hmm. always worked. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to kind of go back a little bit here and just kind of touch on something. You guys have a huge responsibility for the state of California in handling all communications mm -hmm. and radio communications and whatnot. Why um, the state versus, say, Motorola? Um, we have, gosh, I want to say, and I'm probably overstating this, roughly 20 different systems. So. Every department needs something different for their own solutions. Um, but part of, we also did, I need to step back, a radio strategic plan because what we want to do is start moving all the agencies to a system system. Okay. But we're, we have to understand that um, parks may have a different need base than also obviously the California Highway Patrol that runs up and down our highways all the time. Okay. So what we want to do is find like agencies that we can maybe 
consolidate or mm -hmm. merge their systems mm -hmm. together. Um, it's a 10-year plan because mm -hmm. it will take so long to get there because, again, the radio systems last for so long. Mm -hmm. So there is no one company that would give us the solution that we need. Okay. So we have several different solutions out there. And then, in addition, a lot of the componentry that goes along would not be any one type of system. Mm -hmm. We also, with the... Um, we require open architecture and open source. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, the proprietary source, um, we just wouldn't be going forward right. with. Okay. So systems. considering the huge system that PSCO maintains, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that whole maintenance operation. Okay, the maintenance operation. There are folks that are statewide, and they are on. We have folks that are on call throughout um, the weeks. We have a different on-call type of a program. But they're expected to respond to any outage within two hours. Mm -hmm. And it's not your typical health desk, so they can call into our um, network operations center, the NOC, um, anybody has an outage. And what they'll do is we actually have folks rolling within two hours. So we just don't take the trouble to wait to, for two hours to call. Mm -hmm. We actually have folks rolling because the radio system cannot be out. So I believe you have a picture of a snow cap. We do. Um, and so radio systems go down in the middle of snowstorms. So what we do, we actually have nine snowcats strategically placed throughout California where we get a lot of snow. This one um, particular picture shows what they had to do to actually get to the vault. We have several other pictures where the snowcat is up on top of the vault and they're actually opening the trap door on the top of the vault to get down into the vault to do the radio work. Um, very Tr much trained in inclement weather. We make sure that they have the training on how to, of course, use the snow cat, mm -hmm. um, and then also cold weather survival skills. And then we also have a picture of a 4x4 four four driving through uh, some terrain. Um, another example of the, the different uh, pieces of California your folks need to travel through to respond. Yeah, uh, most of our mountaintops are not easily accessible, so it's required that we have four wheel tr um, drive trucks that they can get to the mountaintops, mm -hmm. and in order to do that, they need training mm -hmm. to make sure they do. I've gone to a few of the mountaintops. They always take me to the nice, easy ones, and <laughs> they're still, um, you need a four wheel drive. Yeah. So when they have to respond, we need to make sure that they're trained to be able to respond. Uh, the towers, and we kind of jumped over this, and I want to go back. Mm -hmm. The towers, you saw the installation. We do tower training. Everybody must be certified in tower training, and it's not so much just being able to climb and install, but also they need the first aid part of it. So if mm. one of our staff either has a medical condition or is hurt while mm -hmm. they're up there installing, right. they have to go through training on how to get that person safely off the tower because by the time 911 could respond, mm -hmm. we can't have somebody just sitting up there. And when 911 responds, they wouldn't be trained to go up the tower and right. remove the person anyway. So they go through rigorous training, CPR, first aid as well. And you've touched on the next subject I kind of want to segue into is training. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know, and I'm sure everybody else would be too, is what kind of training do they go through? There's various different things that they do out in the field. Um, we've touched on, you know, working on these, in these four by fours and going up, you know, high terrain, um, t climbing towers, responding to fire incidents mm -hmm. and whatnot. Tell us a little bit more about what the requirements are for their certification and what kind of programs they go through. Okay. And another question too, kind of going into that as well, is um, do they are they required to go out as partners, or are they, do they go mm -hmm. out individually? It depends on where they're going out. So mm -hmm. I'll go back to that in just mm -hmm. a second. Whether they partner up or they go out individually, the training process takes about two years. Um, what we're finding uh, is resources that have the skills that we need, and also have the FCC license to work on FCC frequencies are hard to come by. Mm -hmm. So we have a very difficult retention and um, issue because we get our staff trained and they're usually, you know, somebody else recruits mm -hmm. them for their own. Uh, and, and, you know, with state, the, the salaries are usually different. But it takes about two years for our technicians to actually be trained once they come into our system. So what we're doing now um, is we're working closely with the military. Mm -hmm. They have uh, a TAP program that as the, our, the military is bringing you know, home the troops, mm -hmm. they have a transition program. Mm -hmm. We go there, we let them know what we're doing, that we need folks, so we're recruiting through the military. We're also working with um, American River College. We have 
a couple of tours every time they start a semester. We're working with a professor to start putting some of our curriculum in their training. Radio frequency is not something that's mm -hmm. normally at the colleges. Right. People that go into IT want to do the fun stuff. Mm -hmm. They just really don't realize how much fun this could be as right. well. So we're doing an outreach. But the, the hands-on training is basically what we have to provide. So we have to train on the older legacy radio systems right. as well as the new systems. So we have a whole training program with all the pieces of equipment that they need to be trained on. So we'll have hands-on training within our own facility, but then they also do on-the-job training with a senior technician. And I think we have some slides here too that yeah. we want to um Oh, yeah, so I was, yes. tell us a little bit about those. The incident-based, we have an incident-based team, which this is a training for that. They actually go through training with CAL FIRE on how to survive mm -hmm. in a fire. Because what happens is when there's a large fire, um, a lot of the times they need our radio techs. And our radio techs get deployed out to the incident base. And they actually will report to the communications um, commander there and they will spend their days making sure the radios are programmed so everybody can communicate but if the fire expands out past our communication capabilities they're helicoptered over to the perimeter of the fire where they'll set up a temporary repeater so we will continue the communication so they work hand in hand with the incident base command and without them out there and making sure that the radios can be interoperable and that they have communication systems throughout that fire, um, the firefighters would not be able to communicate and it would be extremely dangerous for them. So they are extremely important at many of these fires. How long does it take to stand up a mobile communication when they're responding out? Okay, it's already stood up by CAL FIRE. By the oh, time, okay. yeah, it's stood up by CAL FIRE, they call our technicians to then become CAL FIRES. Okay. And so they put them in the communication command and that's where they work. Oh, and we won't see them until the fire is done I and see. they're released. So they don't actually have to set that up. What they would have to set up would be the temporary repeaters if they needed to okay. expand their communication system. Okay. okay. And I think we had another slide that was kind of talking about training too. Now what exactly are they doing in this one? They are actually setting up a, a repeater, a temporary repeater out on one of the mountaintops in the fire and you can kind of see the smoke behind them. We have several pictures where you can actually see flames behind them. So sometimes we can't go too far out from the, um, the fire's perimeter or else mm -hmm. the communication system won't work. Right. So they have to be um, pretty adjustable on where they're going to put the repeater and then also have to be very aware of their circumstances, which is why they go through the incident-based training with mm -hmm. CAL FIRE. Now we also respond to civil unrest. If there's a civil unrest, and there's been a couple in San Francisco over the last couple of years where they've been asked to be on standby in case they had to program radios for the interoperability piece. That's so fascinating uh, that you are actually emergency responders and um, not only in, in maintaining equipment but also responding to incidents and then being responsible for coworkers while you're on scene. Yes. Now we only have a couple of minutes uh -huh. left, Karen, and before we release you to go off to your more important day than chatting with me and Lori, um, tell us why all of this matters. It, it all matters. Communications is the basis for all emergency response, whether it's CHP on the road and there, it's a traffic citation, whether it's fighting a fire, whether it's a citizen calling in with an emergency and they're making sure the 911 system works and getting out there, it all matters. Without communication, everything breaks down. It just breaks down. Um, it, CHP could not operate their vehicles and go out and do what they do every day without a communication system that works all the time. Mm -hmm. um, what we base our communication systems on, and in the IT world, they talk about it's up like five nines, which is 9.999. Mm -hmm. Ours is engineered at six nines, and it has to be maintained at six nines, because first responders cannot do their jobs without a radio system that stays up. And the citizens cannot get a hold of their emergency response without the ability to call 911. So, Every day, everything that we do matters. And I've never worked with a more dedicated staff than I have with the public safety communication staff. They come in every day with the dedication to provide these services. So Karen, tell me, um, tell us, what, what are you passionate about in this program? I mean, it's fantastic. Everything that you guys are doing is just amazing. Yeah, just tell us. It's the, the job itself, and I think it goes back to public service. 
Um, we are a public service organization, and I, this is like the prime location to be providing the public service. If I'm in a 911 meeting, that will be my passion. If I'm at uh, a radio, it, 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 this is just something that's so important. It's hard to say that one is more important than the other. It just happens to be the situation at the time. So I'm equally passionate about all the areas, and um, the staff that are in those different areas are also just as passionate about the job. Can you share with us, in your experience, a success story? Like, is there, is there a, a benchmark event that happened with PSCO that, that you go back to, to to share the success of the organization or something that inspired you personally? Oh, um, there, there's been a lot. And I guess it's been the client agency support throughout this. Um, they, what we did, when, uh, when I first came, we had a, a consultant come in, company come in and do a 360 of our organization. And they looked, and we have communication problems, and there's issues with our billings, and there's a lot of different issues. However, everyone said that they were very satisfied with the work, and they would not go anywhere else to have our service done. So every time we meet with client agency, while we always have issues to work through, the passion that we're working for toward the common goal is always there. So it, it's situations like that that I get excited. I get excited when staff are like getting excited themselves about the next generation 911 mm -hmm. and where we're going and getting this text to 911 pilot out, which will be out. Uh, it, it's, it's getting excited with the, the prospect of radio over IP, mm -hmm. which we are just, we have one system set up in the state. It's moving forward. It, it's hard to say one item. I, and it's truly, I love this job. I always say this is like the best job in the state. <laughs> it's just fun. So, I mean, it's an incredible program. And, and I know the public would love to know, is there anything they can do to help PSCO? Um, the public can, by, by giving us feedback, which we, honestly, we have citizens call um, because we want 911 to work for them. And it's pretty amazing. There were, uh, gosh, about five years ago where uh, the backlog of wireless telephones being answered for 911. And we now have a system in place that the calls, we've gone from 40% to 2% because we had a uh, routing on empirical data project. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get those calls to the right PSAP. Mm -hmm. So now we get calls from the public because the expectation has been risen mm -hmm. that the calls are going to be answered when they're not answered. And they give us all the information so we can go back and pinpoint that that may have been an accident on a freeway in Los Angeles or San Francisco, which is usually the case. And then what they do is they let us know they couldn't get through. So that tells mm -hmm. us and strengthens our need to get to next gen. And to give us feedback, um, we, we look at text for 911. We think it's really important. Is it? I believe it is. But the feedback from the public would be extremely important. Thank you so much, Karen, for joining us today. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure our viewers have gotten a lot more information about PSCO, um, it, and, and it's been very helpful. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. And remember, if you need any additional information about the Governor's Office of Emergency Services and the Public uh, Safety Communications Office, you can visit us on the web at www.calema.ca.gov. Thank you.